Hello everyone. So uh, we are live again yet for another author live chat with fans uh, interview and today Sunday stories from the unsung uh, heroes. We have author Shirley Satterfield joining us. Uh, it's the 6th of December 2020 uh, 8 p.m. CST on Facebook page. Thank you for uh, tuning in and uh, today we're going to talk about a very important topic which is uh, about mental health. So today's topic is actually one woman's twofold path to recovery from serious depression. So before we invite author Shirley uh, on the show today, uh, I will be briefly explaining about her. So author Shirley uh, has written creative writing and also um, she's into creative writing and she has also written um, she has also taken non-fiction writing skills and uh, she is a perceptive reader and listener and as a 65 year old woman uh, that's also been to the life life uh, lifelong school of hot knocks and she gave younger younger folks some great pragmatic advice on just about any problem they may have. And uh, she's a devout Christian and a caretaker of, uh, so, uh, of all sorts for her spouse and uh, uh, her spouse who is having special needs. And uh, she also has 10 years of previous experience helping to take care of her gravely ill mom. And uh, in addition to that, she earned a pair of BAs in the English Literature and Journalism Arts. Uh, she spent five years uh, honing a craft as a member of the Writers Studio in uh, South Boston, Virginia. And uh, there are samples of her poetry on a website uh, under the author name of Shirley Mendel. And uh, she has also served in the U.S. Army as a radiology technician participating in Operation uh, New Arrival to help address the refugee uh, crisis following the v Vietnam War and earned an Army Commendation Medal for her service there in the refugee uh, camp, right? So, uh, and uh, on top of that, her memoir is about dealing with uh, hard issues such as child abuse, life-threatening domestic violence, cult membership, and uh, mental illnesses. So, as well as also, not to forget, sexual harassment at work uh, and titled PTSD. So, her book, The Zigzag Path from Hopelessness to Healing, under the author name of Shirley Mendel Satterfield, uh, is published on Lulu and also uh, Amazon, as well as uh, other various major bookstores, online bookstores. So, without further ado, uh, let's Welcome, Arthur Shirley, to the show. Hello, Shirley. Hello. Uh, hello. Welcome to our show. Thank you for joining us today for the uh, Sunday series, uh, Stories from the Unsung Heroes. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to actually have you on our show today because uh, we will be talking about a lot of um, interesting uh, topics, uh, interesting subjects, uh, and why I say interesting is because I think uh, during this pandemic, I think a lot of people are um, especially suffering from various uh, difficulties, various illnesses, various uh, mental uh, illnesses especially. So I think uh, it is uh, about the right time to actually talk about uh, your book and also to discuss some of the important aspects of um, tackling mental illnesses. So it's a pleasure to have you on our show today, Shirley. Thank you for making um, time to actually join us today. And uh, so uh, would you actually uh, like to uh, briefly explain uh, to our audience today about yourself, uh, where you're from, uh, and, uh, and also about your writing journey? Hi. My name is Shirley Mandel Satterfield. That's my pen name. Um, uh -huh. I actually got started with my writing career when I was an inmate 
in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, it was a terrible hospital. It mm -hmm. the poverty there was like really profound. And um, I started writing poetry on, on paper towns. And I just noticed that the more I wrote, the better I felt. So that's mm -hmm. one way that I found to cope with the tremendous stress that mm -hmm. I was under uh, was through creative writing. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, in terms of your um, uh, struggles, uh, I think from your bio itself, uh, will be able to know that you actually went through a lot of um, challenges in life. So that includes um, domestic violence and uh, sexual harassment as well. So um, and, and I also think that uh, part of your life experience uh, with the U.S. Army, I think it is very much uh, interesting as well. So um, where has this problems, I mean, your challenges in life uh, at what point in life um, did it all start? It started in early childhood. Mm -hmm. I had two troubled <clears throat> parents. In fact, mm -hmm. the whole family was troubled. It wasn't just me. I just happened to be the, the scapegoat of the family. Um, my mother was, um, she conceived me out of wedlock. Uh, at a time uh -huh. when she was actually studying to become a Roman Catholic nun, her uh -huh. mother her mother had been grooming her and educating her for her entire childhood to become uh -huh. a nun. And when she got pregnant with me out of wedlock, it was quite the um, scandal, especially back in 1952 when I was born. Uh -huh. um, so I was born in I was born in a in a family that had all this shame uh, mm -hmm. associated with my birth, and mm -hmm. my father was a Protestant, mm -hmm. and that and so he was rejected by my mother's family because he was a Protestant, and mm -hmm. he was a heavy drink he was a heavy drinker. So so what? My, my mother was full of rage and anger and my father was a drinker and they would basically beat each other up in front of us mm -hmm. kids and uh, mm -hmm. the family was fraught with problems of, mm -hmm. of domestic violence and alcohol abuse mm -hmm. and um, child abuse. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so my my diagnosis, my diagnosis is is post traumatic chronic pro post traumatic stress disorder. So mm -hmm. I have to have I've had to learn to cope with stress throughout my life, and it took many years for me mm -hmm. to get a handle on it. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I I think. Um, Especially now, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we have um, a lot of families uh, breaking uh, apart and uh, we are seeing a lot of divorce cases on the rise and uh, especially domestic violence as well, right? So um, how, um, how, how did you, and, and growing up, um, how was the impact of um, having a, a problematic or troublesome childhood, how does that, um, how did that actually impact your um, journey as you were growing up? Well, my life was full of fear. I was in a study, I was premature when I was born. And mm -hmm. Johns Hopkins U University put me in a study where they followed my health progress throughout my childhood. And once a year, someone would come out to the house to ask my parents questions about me. Mm -hmm. And I remember, 
uh, overhearing this conversation between the surveyor, the person doing the survey and my parents. And the person mm -hmm. do, doing the survey asked my parents, uh, they said, is she ever afraid? And they mm -hmm. said, no. And mm -hmm. all I could think about while I lay on my bed was why are they telling this lie? I'm mm -hmm. very afraid in this house. Mm -hmm. the, the, the domestic violence was life threatening and the focus is mainly on the victim of the domestic mm -hmm. violence, the woman that's being beaten or the man that's being beaten. But nobody mm -hmm. talks about the effects of of domestic violence on the children, how the mm -hmm. children are traumatized over and over and over again. And it can lead to a lifetime struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, mm -hmm. bipolar disorder, and schizoaffective disorder. You are ruining your child's health when, mm -hmm. when, when you engage in these violent fights in front of your kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I became yeah. suicidal mm -hmm. by the time I reached high school. I started, at the age of 17, I started to, to consider suicide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those suicidal thoughts followed me all through my life until I finally found the will to live on the inside of me. And mm -hmm. I just turned it all over to God. And uh, mm -hmm. I told the Lord, I said, well, I cannot be a Christian and think these mm -hmm. thoughts too about suicide. Mm -hmm. And I just put the thoughts out of my mind and I haven't thought about it since. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, but, but in terms domestic violence. Yes, domestic violence. Will ruin your child's life. Your problems will ruin your child's life. Mm -hmm. Right. So in terms of getting... So it's yeah. In terms of getting um, diagnosed and uh, uh, I, I'm sure that um, you realizing that you're having problem and uh, um, letting those um, uh, troublesome uh, childhood, I mean, memories of the ch troublesome childhood to actually haunt you um, and transitioning from that to a point where you understand that you need healing and you help yourself. So there must be a, a, a shift from one that phase to another phase where you um, want to help yourself, right? So um, how did that happen and uh, did you get any help from people, uh, especially any anybody that has helped uh, in the past to uh, get to where you are right now? Well, as a child, I had no mentors. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of really good teachers that gave me a chance in school. Mm -hmm. uh, they were going to hold me back in the in the third grade, but my my third grade teacher stepped up and said, "I'll take her in the fourth grade." She was going she was going to move over to the fourth grade, so she worked with me. And then there was my sixth grade teacher, who fostered my creativity. He considered mm -hmm. me to be one of the most creative students in the class. Mm -hmm. But when I became an X ray student, mm -hmm. I had been self harming harming myself mm -hmm. physically and I, I just decided that I needed a psychiatrist. My parents mm -hmm. didn't get me any help. Mm -hmm. I, I went to the administrator of the radiology school that I was attending and asked him if he could help me find a psychiatrist that worked for the hospital where I was training and he agreed to do so. I took myself, I took responsibility for myself because I was tired of the pain. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't realize that it was going to take years of, of therapy to, to get control of my life. I didn't mm -hmm. know that. It, 
That's why the book is called The Zigzag Path from Hopelessness mm -hmm. to Healing. It's a long zigzag path. You get better, you get worse. You take one step forward, you take two steps back, you take three more steps forward and maybe one step back. It's a zigzag path. Mm -hmm. It's turbulent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people can but, actually relate to that. Like, you know, uh, because I think recovery or healing is actually never uh, a linear path. Well, they didn't really have the medications. This was 1970. And the only medication they really had, they had two medications available for, for psychiatric patients. And that was Stelazine and Thorazine. Both of those powerful medications actually caused me to have, see, they, if they were treating the wrong illness, they were treating uh -huh. me for schizophrenia when I was actually showing symptoms of bipolar disorder. They didn't mm -hmm. have medication for bipolar <clears throat> disorder. So they gave me the wrong medications. And today the medications are so refined. Mm hmm and, and they are so, they are effective. And recovery is not only possible, but probable in our day mm -hmm. and age with the, right, with the right treatment. But so mm -hmm. many people let stigma stand in the way of mm -hmm. either letting their loved ones get help or they themselves going for help. They let the stigma and the shame of, mm -hmm. of these illnesses um, and actually the person has to take you have to take responsibility for yourself when you're mm -hmm. when you're the sick one you have to take responsibility and it it's medical neglect not to get the mm -hmm. help that you need mm -hmm. right so um in terms of um so when did this happen i mean like um uh, i think you were struggling until you were um, uh, until your the late teenage years, and uh, so when did you actually realize that you need to help yourself? At what point? Around what age? I was in radio X-ray technology school. I was nineteen when I first reached out for help, mm -hmm. but then I got called up in in, in false religion that did not believe in psychiatrists and mental health um, professionals. They did not believe in it. So I got steeped in this uh, dark kind of religion. And, it, and so I, I just continued to suffer these bouts of depression while I was in the service. And I, mm -hmm. I met my first husband, um, after after the refugee camp service that I performed, um, I met my first husband, and we had like a whirlwind romance. And we got I was we got married at, only after knowing each other about eight weeks, and uh, mm -hmm. and I found I found myself out of the service, and mm -hmm. I went to Hawaii to be. My husband was stationed in Hawaii, and I went to Hawaii to be with him. And I was dealing with uh, depression then, but then there was a tragedy in the family while I was in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, my my younger brother had a car accident that put him in a coma for a year, and mm -hmm. uh, he finally passed away. And the trauma of that put me in an even deeper depression. Mm -hmm. And it was then that I decided to, to reach out for help again. I was about 30 years old then. And that's when I started going in and out of psychiatric hospitals. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um... Psychiatric hospitals. Yes, you were saying something. Psychiatric hospitals are not fun places. They are dismal places. 
but I had mm -hmm. to be there in order for the professionals to protect me from myself. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, in terms of getting uh, treatment and uh, uh, the side effects and, and how, how was that journey? I mean, I, I'm sure that it must have been a very um, tiring uh, journey. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, getting constant medications and uh, getting treatment, uh, going for consultation. Um, ha how has it been uh, for you? Well, actually, I have found, like I said, the twofold path I found to recovery. Mm -hmm. The first path was spiritual, spiritual. Mm -hmm. I, I had to get my heart right with God. Mm -hmm. I am a devout Christian and my faith is very important to me. I, mm -hmm. I, I had to confess my sins and mm -hmm. I had to learn to forgive those who had sinned against me. And then mm -hmm. you have to apologize to the people that you have hurt along the way because mental mm -hmm. illness will cause you to lash out at other people mm -hmm. so i had to repent i had to um turn away from my sin and to uh and to get forgiveness from god now this is what worked for me not everyone believes in god but i do and this is what worked for me i got my spiritual mm -hmm. house in order first mm -hmm. And then there right, were so, practical things I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The practical side, the practical side of the path was to get professional help. Number one, mm -hmm. regardless, despite the efforts of my family to keep me from getting this help because mm -hmm. of the stigma involved, stigma causes just as much pain to the person who suffers mental illness as the illness itself. And it's stigma that leads to people actually committing these terrible acts of suicide, even homicide. But you have mm -hmm. to take responsibility for your own life. If, if mm -hmm. you're suffering this illness, if you have diabetes, for instance, you got to take yourself to the doctor and get tested. Mm -hmm. And, and then take the medication the doctor orders. It's your responsibility to get help, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of how your family is trying to, to stop you um, mm -hmm. or your friends or your the people in the church trying to stop you. You are responsible for your own health. So that's the first thing I did was to, to get professional help. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing I did was to, to get involved in a creative pursuit. Mm -hmm. That helps a person to deal with stress, creativity, art therapy. Mm -hmm. Whatever your talent is, whether it be journaling, poetry, art, music, those kind of things, that those will help you to cope with this, with the ongoing stresses in your life. And then there's prayer and meditation and devotional reading. You have, mm -hmm. you have to put in positive things into mm -hmm. your mind in order to, to feel positive on the inside. So I mm -hmm. read devotional books and Christian books and um, affirmational type quotes. You have mm -hmm. to you have to, to talk to yourself. You have to talk to yourself positive things and read mm -hmm. positive things. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, it's input output. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, um, the relationship uh, that you have with people around you when you were um, having chronic depression, um, how did that affect it? Uh, how did that affect people around you? And uh, uh, 
did you realize that it is affecting the quality of relationship that you have uh, with people around you? And what were the measures that you took back then to um, uh, to come out of it? Or probably to not let depression affect the uh, quality of relationship that you have with people around you? Well, well there for a while I had no friends. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um the only mm -hmm. person the only person standing between me and a suicide's death was my therapist but then mm -hmm. i reached out to people i reached out to people who were suffering the same thing i was suffering mm -hmm. i i joined a, a support network of people who are also suffering from mental illnesses support group mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. And I got involved in a psychosocial program. Mm -hmm. A psychosocial program is where they bring the people into one building that is sort of like a day program for mm -hmm. uh, for recovery, like a day hospital. And you mm -hmm. just you just make friends with your peers, and the peers mm -hmm. the peers will support one another. We all become mm -hmm. friends with one another and give each other emotional support. Mm -hmm. And um, so in terms of um, getting support from um, people who not just having the same kind of problems that you're having, but uh, apart from that, people who like, you know, family and friends, uh, friends, especially probably at work, your colleagues, um how, how did they actually support you and um has it affected your work performance um you know because i know that uh chronic depression can actually affect your mood a lot and uh, it would also affect the quality of work um day-to-day uh, -day activities so how has it uh, been for you and oh. were your colleagues helpful in, in any ways? I had a friend at work, one friend, mm -hmm. and she was very supportive. We would go to the health club together and uh, she worked with me on my shift. Mm -hmm. And we became, she became a Christian too and started praying for me. I had that support, but I didn't have any friends. And, um, Depression, depression will cause you to to lash out at other people, and I had a lot of people mad with me. To be mm -hmm. honest with you, um, mm -hmm. that's why it's important to get on the proper medication to mm -hmm. um, mitigate these these symptoms, so that you can be free to make friends. But as far as my family was concerned. My family was toxic. I left mm -hmm. them. I left mm -hmm. them and moved to another city to where I could where I could be on my stand on my own two feet. Mm -hmm. But I did eventually go I did eventually go come back into my parents' lives. When they mm -hmm. became old and and sickly, I was called mm -hmm. upon to help them. And I I felt like, well, this is my calling mm -hmm. to help my mm -hmm. elderly parents because mm -hmm. they brought me into the world. They raised me, they worked and, um, and I felt like it was what God would have me to do to honor my mother and my father and to take care of my parents. And I did that for a period of about five years. I, li mm -hmm. I lived in, the, in in their rental property and I would help with mm -hmm. the housework and the mowing and help my father with my mother when she was sick. And mm -hmm. I was with them to the very end. And the last, the last word I said to my mother was, I love you, mom. And the last mm -hmm. word I said to my father when he died was, I love you, dad. Mm -hmm. But, right. but so, in order to recover, I had to get over that 
I had to get away from that and and mm. and support myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it can be a very difficult uh, decision to make, uh, especially to um, part from your family, to decide to part from your family for a bit and. Uh, to find your own path of healing and to find your own truth, um, uh, to not be uh, distracted or be influenced by your family values, the, the kind of beliefs that your family has um, versus the kind of uh, values or, or the, the wants and needs that you have for yourself, right? So, um, uh, and in when coming to cult membership and um, members of the church and why do you think back then and even now so why do you think that um approaching a therapist back then was uh, was not something accepted and how has it changed right now uh, is it is it better um uh, is the stigma better i mean has it like uh, gone uh, better over the years ha uh, in terms of the stigma has it uh, you know uh, people are people are still having stigma uh, pertaining to mental health and uh, how do they view it um, do you do do they encourage you to um, people with mental illnesses to go and get professional help or do they like still um, you know refrain from going for uh, professional help Um, the church I'm in now um, encourages uh, me to, to, to stay in therapy and they don't stand in my way. It, it was it, the, the church I was in uh, when I was mm -hmm. younger was, was, was fraught with superstition. It was a mm -hmm. superstitious church. Um, they believed in faith. Mm -hmm. healing and a lot of people in the church died of things like cancer just because they wouldn't go to the doctor um some of these churches are very cult-like uh mm -hmm. in their beliefs but I, I find less stigma today than there was um than there was in the past Mm -hmm. but the pastors of these churches still lack training to know how mm -hmm. to deal with someone um who's going through a crisis they they lack training and mm -hmm. um and i think there's room for improvement mm -hmm. in the church mm -hmm. what we really right. want is a hug you know we just want mm -hmm. we just we just need a little bit of extra uh, attention um, given to us and, and reassurance, not so much attention, but reassurance that we're mm -hmm. wanted and we're loved and we're accepted. We flourish when we know we're mm -hmm. being accepted. Mm -hmm. Right. So <clears throat> we need compassion. Mm -hmm. I mean, to people out there, like uh, especially now who um, who are having this, you know, with this situation of lockdown, uh, we have COVID-19 making things worse and uh, people are losing jobs and um, that has escalated uh, uh, domestic violence even further and, uh, you know, uh, with divorce cases rising, a lot of families are breaking uh, apart and... Um, uh, I think right now, uh, the children, I mean, the, the, the children that are growing up uh, in this period of time, they have uh, more access to um, mental health care uh, facilities and uh, therapies and, and things like that. So um, what would you advise them? Because I think uh, uh, it is uh, important for the children to actually be able to help themselves, uh, like like uh, what you've explained earlier, I think it is up to the individuals to identify that they, to even, to identify is one thing, but to accept the fact that they are being raised in, uh, in a toxic family, right? So 
what would you advise to anyone out there who is being a uh, victim of domestic violence and vic victim of a toxic environment actually not just toxic families but i think toxic environment overall and they want to get out of it uh, what is the first step that they should take in order to um, you know uh, get into self awareness and then uh, move forward to the path of recovery and healing i would say if if you if you don't feel safe call the police i mean mm -hmm. if you're not safe call the cops mm -hmm. you know and get the get the abuser removed from your home mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I actually, I'm no expert on how on, on how to uh, get help during this COVID virus, but mm -hmm. I would just say that if you're not safe, call the police, and mm -hmm. and and go to a shelter if you have to. Uh, like Dr. Phil, we have Dr. Phil here in the United States. You know, mm -hmm. he's a TV psychologist. He's quite accomplished. And he tells women all the time, you're better off living in a box under a bridge than with an abuser. Mm -hmm. Don't let a house, don't let, don't let material things stand between you and your freedom. If you have to get a cheap apartment, do whatever you have to do to get yourself and your kids out of the abuser's home. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, coming to this, right, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, women getting out or stepping out of a marriage uh, that is no longer working or even um, leaving an abusive partner, I think it is extremely important for the women to make the right decision because I think when you were young, you were not able to... Um, realize uh, you you did not have that, that power to do, make the right decision for yourself uh, but I think as a grown-up woman uh, in an abusive relationship I think uh, they will be able to make better decisions for their kids and uh, like how uh, like what you've said earlier I think it is important to identify if the abuse is not stopping anytime soon um, and the abuser is also not showing any signs of uh, uh, improvement or changing towards becoming a better person. Uh, it is always better to uh, leave the environment for the sake of children, right? So for the women out there, um, what do you, uh, what will you say? I mean, if you were to be in your mother's um, situation I think you know what could have been done to salvage or probably to just save the kids um, from being raised in an abusive uh, environment flee. <laughs> I would say flee the premises uh, go to a <laughs> friend's house a relative house a shelter mm -hmm. anywhere you a hotel room <laughs> go every woman needs her own income mm -hmm. a, uh, a, a marketable skill you know go mm -hmm. on welfare if you have to but get out <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so wasn't it um, jk rollings the woman that the woman that wrote the um harry potter series she was mm -hmm. in an abusive relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. with a husband and she <laughs> went on welfare she got her kids mm -hmm. out and went on welfare and mm -hmm. um made her own way and she did quite mm -hmm. well thank you very much she did quite well mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. just leave leave the premises mm -hmm. find shelter anywhere you can just get your mm -hmm. kids out of there Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, coming to your book, uh, the zigzag. Yes. So, coming to your book, the uh, zigzag path from hopelessness to healing. Um, 
overcoming PTSD, which is, you have a very a beautiful sketch, a beautiful uh, book cover. Uh, you know, yes, it's uh, it's there. I think uh, viewers can actually um, take a look at the book itself. So tell us a little bit about the book and also about your creative writing. And uh, uh, you have also earned um, degrees in, in, in literature and creative writing. So um, uh, when did you decide to study? When did you decide to pursue um, your journey in, 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 in education and furthering your education in creative writing? Well, I call it a dream. When I started mm -hmm. writing poetry, it felt so good. It fe just felt so good. And mm -hmm. I noticed when I was in the psychosocial program that mm -hmm. the, the clients there um, really related to poetry. And mm -hmm. I thought this would be a good way to communicate positive thoughts about God to them. Is through, mm -hmm. through poetry. And I started sending poetry to my friend at home in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. see, see, I'm from Baltimore. I started sending poetry home to my friend in Baltimore and she wrote mm -hmm. me a letter and she just, she just told me that I have a gift and that she was going to pray for me that my poetry would go worldwide. Mm -hmm. And I just called a dream. I mm -hmm. wanted to lift up the name of the Lord in the, mm -hmm. through the medium of poetry, and my 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 vision was a worldwide vision. Mm -hmm. So when I was going to um, the clubhouse, the uh, psychosocial program, they sent me to um, mm -hmm. to the Department of Re Rehabilitative Services to take a test to see where I would fit in with the job market because I was going to get a job, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I did so well on the test that they said they would help me go to college mm -hmm. and that they would help me finance my college education. So I decided I would pursue the vocation of a writer. And mm -hmm. since then, I have self-published about six books of poetry mm -hmm. and two memoir. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, as you can see over here, uh, I am actually sharing a screen from uh, your Amazon page uh, to the book that we are discussing right now, uh, which is the zigzag path from hopelessness to healing, overcoming PTSD. So. Uh, this is where uh, audience, if they are interested, they can actually get a copy of this book. So uh, would you briefly like to explain what you have um, written in, uh, in the book and, and what does it entail? This book is my life. See? Mm -hmm. I am a survivor of serious mental illness, and this is mm -hmm. my story. Mm -hmm. The book chronicles how this illness developed in my early childhood, what it's like to be in a hospital. If you ever wonder, well, what just what is it like to be in a psychiatric hospital? Well, I describe mm -hmm. that. I describe mm -hmm. in great detail the horrors of what it feels like to have a psychotic break. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, and, then, and then how I came out of it, how I left my family, how I got the help I needed, and um, how I met my husband. There's a little love story in here about mm -hmm. my second husband and I. And, um, I'm basically leading a normal, productive life right now. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I write for the dailywisdomworks.com writers community. I'm a blogger mm -hmm. for them. And, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I'm, my poetry has gone worldwide through the mm -hmm. internet. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't, the internet wasn't even thought about when I caught this tree. So I didn't know what form it was going to take. And it, it, it's just, um, we live in an amazing time when you can mm -hmm. reach, you can, you can reach for the stars now with the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I would like to read, I would like to read. Book ends with, um, with, oh, it's not in this one, this copy. It's basically a five steps to recovery that I write about. Mm -hmm. Getting your spiritual health in order, mm -hmm. forsaking toxic relationships, mm -hmm. finding a way to express yourself artistically or through a hobby, mm -hmm. doing something productive with your life, like a mm -hmm. job or going back to school, Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, um, I when you mentioned that uh, finding something, um, I mean, getting into creative arts, right? But um, I do feel that um, different people will have different uh, interests. And I think um, it is extremely important for those who are suffering from um, any kind of mental illness to actually find what makes them feel better and to pursue them and to do that more often and, and um, get involved in it actively so that it keeps them sane, it keeps them um, away from the troubles that they are facing, right? So um, how did you actually discover that, you know, writing is the one that actually helps you? Uh, and not just anything else that you, it may be cooking, it may may have been uh, knitting, uh, you know, it, it could have been some other things that, you know, help, uh, help to help you uh, overcome your difficulties. But uh, what specifically made you think that writing is the one that's for you? Because that's what makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. It seems mm -hmm. like the more I wrote, the more well I got. The more mm -hmm. the better sense of well-being I had. Mm -hmm. um, the only biggest piece of advice I can give people out there is just don't let stigma stop you from getting the help you need. Mental illness can lead to some terrible places. It can mm -hmm. lead to friendlessness, homelessness, suicide, or prison. Mm -hmm. If I have a choice between a suicide grave and a short stint in a psychiatric hospital, I'll take the hospital. I'll, mm -hmm. If you feel like you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else, you need to turn yourself over to the mental health authorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I, I actually we are coming uh, to the end of the show uh, and uh, what would you tell the audience out there who will be watching this later on uh, I'm gonna be putting this up on Instagram as well as on LinkedIn as well uh, obviously it's gonna go up on YouTube as well so uh, I hope that this reaches out to a lot more people and um, and uh, because of that, uh, I think uh, uh, we probably people who are watching this need to know what you have to tell uh, to them, especially if they are having mental illnesses or probably if they're suffering from mild anxiety, mild depression, uh, what you have to say to them. Well, if it's just mild, the first thing you need to do is go to your, your general practitioner, your primary care doctor, mm -hmm. and let them make sure there's not a physical reason why you're feeling low. Mm -mm. And let them take it from there. Let them mm -hmm. refer you to the specialist mm -hmm. that you need to go to. 
-hmm. if you go to your general practitioner and you get a blood test for mm -hmm. uh, diabetes, that general, at least here in the States, that's how it works. The general doctor will re refer you to the specialist. Um, mm -hmm. Just trust your doctor and um, and find a therapist that you can relate to, someone that has an air of compassion about them. Mm -hmm. Because the, the thing that you need the most to recover is love. That's what you're looking mm -hmm. for, love. I found mm -hmm. love in God and I found caring and support with my peers and with mm -hmm. and and in my in the therapeutic relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the first thing right. you do is you go to your medical doctor yeah mm -hmm. right so um also i mean in in terms of um your writing journey uh, you mentioned that you have written two memoirs and uh, one is uh, the zigzag path, uh, and the other one, what is it about? Is it also about um, your journey in, in uh, dealing with mental health uh, issues? Well, it's called the it's called the shadowy world of the poor. Mm -hmm. It's all about different people that I met in a storefront church. You see, here in the states. The poor churches meet in a storefront. They don't have the big mm -hmm. cathedrals and the mm -hmm. big uh, and the and the big brick churches. They meet mm -hmm. in a little storefront, and that's mm -hmm. the kind of church I was going to when I was going to college. And I met all kinds of colorful people. Mm -hmm. um, I met saints and I met sinners, and I and I mm -hmm. write about them all. And 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 book ends with a, a theory of what actually causes poverty it that mm. it's a my theory is that it's a it's a way of life it's a, a culture of poverty uh, mm. that's handed down from generation to generation and but the the meat of the book is is these is is personality sketches of these different poor people that i met at this rescue mm -hmm. mission and that's pretty interesting. So you have, do you have um, um, any other books coming up uh, pertaining to mental health or uh, any other projects that you are actually working on right now? Right now I'm working on, on a, a chat book, a poetry chat book entitled Porch Poems. It's all mm -hmm. about the nature around my house, you know, the mm -hmm. birds and the sky and the squirrels. Mm -hmm. It's all poetry about nature that I could just see from my front porch. Mm -hmm. it, it was like a form of meditation for me to write these poems. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's going to be quite good. It's, it, it's coming out in January. Mm. So it's almost over and uh, uh, I think uh, Right now, you are in the editing process, or probably in the um, refining uh, the final stages of preparing a manuscript for publication. Is it going to be up on uh, Amazon? It's going to be on Amazon, and it's going to be next year's my personal submission to the Pulitzer Prize Board. That's my dream is to win a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, it's a lofty mm -hmm. dream, but it doesn't cost mm -hmm. anything to dream, you know. So I've yes. had two books approved. I've had two books approved by them already. And that's mm -hmm. gonna be my third submission. They do awesome. accept they do accept submissions from free from freelance authors. And mm -hmm. So that's my little submission next year. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, I mean, it, it has been uh, uh, a great pleasure to talk to you this evening, um, Shirley. And uh, I think we have discussed quite a bit about uh, mental health. And uh, I hope it is my hope that people out there uh, suffering from chronic depression 
I hope that they will be able to find some inspiration from your journey and uh, from your advices given throughout this interview as well as in your book as well. So um, if they want to like check it out, they can always go to Amazon.com uh, and uh, find for the uh, zigzag path. Uh, so if they just, I think if they will be able to find your book by just um, you know, uh, clicking on the link that I have uh, added to the comments uh, on, on Facebook. They will be able to look at it. And also by searching the zigzag path from hopelessness to healing, overcoming PTSD. So um, thank you for joining us. Actually, thank you for joining us for today's show. And uh, it was a pleasure having you. Hoping to also talk to you in some of the uh, time. Uh, thank, thank you for making time to actually uh, come to our show and share some really valuable insights from your life and also from your experience healing from uh, chronic depression, Shirley. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot and uh, have a great evening. Thank you, too. I know I'm not the best speaker in the world. I write a lot better than I speak believe me but i just want to thank you for this opportunity where are you broadcasting from are you in great britain i i am not uh, i am in malaysia right now so it is monday it's going to be 11 i think it is 11 in the morning right now yes it's 11 in the morning already right now so it is monday already for us uh, it is it is sunday still where you are right now in the states so i'm streaming from malaysia and yeah we are like miles apart oh, you really you really picked my brain tonight i'll tell you thank you very uh, much it was a pleasure it was a pleasure because i i wanted you to come on to the show tonight because i know that um, it will be helpful for so many people out there um, in dilemma to you know whether or not it, to to seek uh, a therapist, whether or not they should go and get help. Because a lot of people they hesitate to even seek help, and they think that you know seeking help uh, when they have uh, mental illness is something. Uh, shameful right so I think the stigma is still there right I mean uh, of course we have come a stigma long way from still there still there uh, from 1950s of course things you, would have been worse back then but I think the stigma is still there uh, even now it is still there so it is very crucial to help people uh, understand that it is okay to be not okay. It is okay to be not okay, and it is okay to seek professional help. Yes, it is, and it's your life on the line. Don't let yes. stigma or any individual, any judgmental individual, don't let them mm -hmm. stop you from getting mm -hmm. help. It's your life on the line, not theirs. Mm -hmm. It's your, awesome. it's your funeral, not theirs. Correct. So take exactly. care of yourself. Exactly. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you for joining us and uh, hoping to see you in uh, uh, our next shows, hopefully. And uh, thank you so much. Have a great uh, evening, Shirley. Thank you.